A New York jury in the federal trial of R. Kelly is expected to begin deliberations today. The R&B star is on trial for federal racketeering charges, including allegedly running a criminal enterprise involving sex trafficking of women and underage girls. Nancy Chen reports on the surprising comparison Kelly's defense lawyer made during closing arguments. R. Kelly's defense started its closing arguments by comparing the R&B singer's trial to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s fight for constitutional rights. They argue the government has purposely misled jurors. The defense had testimony from five witnesses over two days, while prosecutors, which had the burden of proof, called 45 witnesses over 19 days. That included several women and men accusing Kelly of sexual and psychological abuse. One was a former girl girlfriend testifying anonymously as Jane. In a 2019 interview with Gail King, she defended Kelly and did not consider herself a victim. I'm happy doing what I'm doing. I haven't figured out what I want to do with my life, but right. I know when that time comes, we know Robin's going to support us regardless. Right. But last month, she told the court Kelly brainwashed her and others. It's part of the testimony which took more than a month, where prosecutors say the singer used his, quote, money in public persona to hide his crimes in plain sight. Kelly's defense argued the accusations were being made by disgruntled exes who were after his fortune. Kelly has always maintained his innocence, including in a 2019 interview with Gail King. Have you ever had sex no. with anyone under the age of 17? No. Never. No. Priya Sapori is an attorney with years of experience in crimes against children. What do you make of R. Kelly not taking the stand himself? I think it's difficult for people not to wonder why he would be willing to address those allegations in the media with Ms. King, but unwilling to do so when he's under oath. Kitty Jones is a former girlfriend of Kelly's. She was not on the stand during this trial, but she was one of the first to speak out against him. I feel like justice for me has just been about me being a silence breaker in this and being believed. That was Nancy Chen reporting. For analysis of this case and the closing arguments, let's bring in CBS News, a legal contributor and former Manhattan prosecutor, Rebecca Royfe. Good morning, Rebecca. You heard in Nancy's report that R. Kelly's defense compared Kelly to Martin Luther King Jr. How do you think that went over with the jury? You know, that comparison was a little incoherent, and I think observers are struggling to figure out exactly what he was trying to do. I mean, on a certain level, I suppose, he was trying to suggest that, you know, as a powerful black man, he's being targeted just the same way Martin Luther King was being targeted. He asked the jury to be courageous in the same way Martin Luther King was courageous by standing up and doing the right thing and acquitting R. Kelly. But, you know, none of that makes a whole lot of sense, given what the charges are here. And it is an extreme comparison and I think unlikely to succeed. You know, it may also be that he's trying to infuse or sort of capitalize a little bit on the social movements, Black Lives Matter and so forth, suggesting that as a black man, he's being targeted by the criminal justice system. But again, this is just speculation. And I don't think any of it is going to be successful in altering the jury's perspective here. We also heard from an attorney in Nancy's piece saying that she thought it was strange that Kelly didn't take the stand. But given how temperamental Kelly got, uh, for example, in his interview with Gail King a couple of years ago, was his defense doing damage control? Would you have put him on the stand? I definitely would not have put him on the stand. First of all, it's important to just, you know, people should remember that a defendant has a constitutional right not to take the stand and that jurors are told and instructed that they cannot take the fact that he didn't take the stand as a sign of guilt. You know, if you're a defense attorney, it's always kind of a game of Russian roulette to put your client on the stand. And that's even more so when you have a client like R. Kelly, who has demonstrated that he has a huge temper and is incredibly emotional about these sorts of charges that can really backfire. So this was absolutely the right decision not to put him on the stand. The prosecution ended up presenting nine times more witnesses than the defense did. We know the burden of proof is on the prosecution, but do juries read into that at all? 
you know, they might, there, it really is, you know, quite, um, normal, quite, uh, usual to, um, for the prosecution to present far more, um, far more witnesses than the defense. Sometimes the defense presents no witnesses at all. And as you say, that's because of the burden of proof. I mean, all the defense has to do is show reasonable doubt. They can do that through cross-examination. So I, I don't think this is unusual. Whether, um, the extreme difference here, uh, does make the defense think, you know, it might. I think it's really the sheer number of accusers and the amount of evidence that is really going to be difficult for the defense to combat, not exactly the numbers, um, but rather the how powerful that testimony was. Well, one of the defense's arguments was that Kelly's relationships were consensual and that the accusers stuck around him because of the, quote, lavish lifestyle that Kelly provided for them. But given how many people testified against Kelly saying that he abused them, how effective is that argument? Um, I don't think it's um, as effective as um, you know he might like for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think that's becoming less and less effective. I think that the our, our community, that America is becoming more aware of how these power dynamics work. And ever since the Harvey Weinstein trial, people understand that sometimes victims do hang around and even communicate with their abuser. And that's becoming more part of the cultural conversation. So I think it's not as successful for that reason. The second reason is the um, the age of some of these accusers. I think that 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 just adds credibility to this notion that, you know, you might be so confused and so overwhelmed by the power dynamic here and, uh, you know, unable to sort this out in a way that makes it clear that you should go report it right away. I, I, you know, I mean, I think that's one of their most effective arguments that they can make, but I'm not sure how effective it will be considering all those factors. And Rebecca, one last question for you. I'm wondering what evidence in this trial is really going to stick out to the jury most, in your opinion, and how long do you expect deliberations to take? So there are two things, I think, um, you know, that, 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 uh, how compelling the victim testimony was. I think obviously stories appeal to juries and words appeal to juries, personalities and emotions appeal to juries. So I think, you know, for, first and foremost, that testimony, especially from the young girls, you know, the girls who were young at the time, that their, their interactions with R. Kelly are going to be um, extremely compelling. Second, you know, in terms of the legal charges, I think that the prosecution did a good job of showing that this was something thing, you know, as the prosecutor said, hidden in plain sight, that he didn't do this alone. He did this with a whole entourage full of managers and assistants who were helping him uh, procure the women and secure them and, um, and, and, and prey on them, really. And I think that testimony is also really compelling, in part because, you know, one person can commit a crime and one person can be dangerous, but when they have an entourage like that, when they have an organization, as the RICO charge suggests, that danger is augmented significantly. So I think the coupling of those two things, one, the victim testimony, and second, the entourage full of managers and assistants who are helping him are both pretty compelling pieces of evidence. And we'll see if the defense can counter that with its suggestion that, you know, this was consensual and these were a bunch of hangers on and super fans who were you know just uh, upset later on and trying to bring charges against the singer because they didn't um, you know end up where they wanted to be well Rebecca Royfe we are all anxiously waiting to find out what the jury decides thank you for your analysis thank you so much for having me